Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest in my series of live stream sessions from here in the Barn Theatre, the wonderful Barn Theatre in Sirencester. Now, today, as everybody knows, is Good Friday. It's a very special day in the religious calendar for some. And therefore, we felt that we should alter the format of this afternoon's session from a strictly Q&A session to one of helping and listening to what people are doing in the individual communities and praising those that have gone to extra special lengths to help their communities. So, as I said, we will alter today's uh, format, and I am delighted to be joined today by the Reverend John Cannon Swanton, who is uh, representing his uh, parishes in the South Cotswolds. He's also representing the diocese. But furthermore than that, he's here on a non-denominational basis to represent peoples of all faiths. Now, I'm delighted that he's here. What he's going to do to start with is give us his thoughts for today. He's then going to join us in the discussion overall. So without any further ado, I'm wel delighted to welcome John here. And over to you, John, please. So, Geoffrey, thank you very much for your welcome. Last year, I joked with a couple of people that I was thinking about giving up church for Lent. Not really an option for a vicar, or so we thought. Well, a year later, what seemed to be improbable or impossible became a new reality. In normal circumstances, you wouldn't find me here at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. Around about now, I'd be in Amni Crucis Church, the Church of the Holy Rood, following our Good Friday service, just leaving the church. I wouldn't be speaking. We leave in silence to remind us of the events that happened and grieved people 2,000 years ago, waiting in, in anticipation for the astonishing and joyful events of Easter, which would change the world. Good Friday is the most solemn day in the Christian calendar, and so I would spend the rest of the afternoon in the garden, quietly doing weeding and quietly pondering. At the risk of sounding a little bit Puritan, you wouldn't find me here in a theatre. One of the great festivals of the Jewish faith is held at this time of year as well, the Feast of the Passover, when families gather together to share their meal and remember the Israelites fleeing from Egypt, gaining their freedom and moving to the Promised Land. This year, those meals have been held at tables, but with few present. But held they have been, with more and more people using social media to bring their families together. My rabbi friend wouldn't have thought that possible or desirable last year, but the world has changed. And later this month, our Muslim friends will be starting to keep Ramadan, a time of fasting and of reading the Quran. That will be a different experience for them too. Now that all places of worship across our land have been closed, we're needing to embrace modern technology that's new to many of us. The reality is that most of us have a tendency to dislike or distrust or even resist change. And if life is about anything, it's about change. We live through changing months, years and seasons. We grow up, learn, grow older, grow our relationships and families. We move around and we change jobs. We live and love and learn, feel pain and joy, loss and gain. And I think we're now looking at a time of significant change into the future. We may look to the future with some trepidation, but we can also make a decision to look to the future with a positive attitude. In this current crisis, I've been reassured at my belief that, generally speaking, people are good. And it's proving to be the case. All kinds of people are responding positively and creatively, wanting to support their neighbours and those around them. In this town of Sirencester and in the villages, people are volunteering. Volunteer groups and helping hands were quickly put into place with lots of volunteers, even before the government asked for volunteers as a task force to support vulnerable people. 
Neighbours are now meeting neighbours whom they haven't met before and generating a renewed sense of community. Well, didn't someone once say, love your neighbour? And by the way, a quick plug. If you do need some help and you don't know where to go or what to do, please ring your vicar or a minister of religion, of whatever religion. They're usually very well networked and they surely will know someone who will be able to help. We're all here for you. We also have people willing to do their duty, yes, with some trepidation, serving us on the front line in hospitals, care homes, surgeries, pharmacies, schools, and so much more. We're learning again that we can achieve great things together. Dare I say, in this present company, this can-do can attitude has enabled the Chancellor to find that mythical magic money tree, well, apparently an orchard of them, and the first Nightingale Hospital was built in nine days, and there are more to come. Our vir virologists and chemists are working together at pace to find a vaccine. We can do great things when we work together. We're finding out what matters and who matters to us, and making contact with people with whom we've lost touch. And having some time on our hands, I hope that we will use that time to think slower. Maybe the world before was just a bit too fast, a bit too stretched and unceasing. We don't need to have a society that lives at breakneck speed. We can live and work together better. And we have time to think about our own reactions to what's going on around us, to ask ourselves, What's making me anxious? What's giving me joy? What really doesn't matter? And what and who matters to me? Easter story, the Easter story is the story of new life, radical change, faith and belief. We need to use these themes in our world rather than confining them to the realm of religion. The future feels uncertain but this is an opportunity to be seized, for we now have a unique opportunity to transform our society for the good and for all. I hope we'll take it and get this done. Thank you. John, thank you for those uh, really wise and moving words. I think they will bear close scrutiny, and of course they are online, so people can reread them at their leisure, and I hope that they do, because I think they were really constructive. Thank you. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this latest session, as I've already said, in, of my live streaming in the Barn Theatre in Sarancester. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by Reverend John Cannon Swanton from the Ampneys and his South Cotswold parishes. Uh, as I've said, this uh, session is uh, an altered format. So, Easter and spring is a time of hope for a renewed future. It is a se season of growth with nature coming alive again around us, with flowers and trees blooming. The days are longer and lighter and warmer. It is a time of optimism, enthusiasm, and positive change. Now more than ever, we need the light, hope, and opportunity of spring. Whatever our circumstances, things will get better. This is also a weekend for family, and it is with great sadness that many of us cannot see our loved ones and celebrate as we would do normally. Coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced in decades probably since the Second World War. But I hope you will forgive me by stressing again, by staying at home, we are protecting the NHS and saving lives. A special mention must go to all the doctors, nurses, all care professionals, cleaners, food chain workers, utility workers, and other key workers who will not be with their families this weekend but instead, they will be working incredibly hard to save <laughs> lives and keep our country going. We 
pay a very sincere tribute to them. Today, to mark Easter weekend, we would like to discuss the way communities and individuals have stepped up during these unprecedented times to support each other. We will be discussing some great ideas on how we can help each other and taking a moment to thank all those heroes going above and beyond during this crisis to help their communities. The team here at the Barn Theatre have been doing a splendid job of running these sessions and similar ones that are benefiting our community. And here I would like to pay a special tribute again to David Fowles. He is indefatigable at helping me shape these uh, sessions and I pay a very sincere tribute to him. This weekend, the Barn Theatre Wardrobe Department have answered a call for help from local hospitals and have been working incredibly hard to make handmade scrubs for frontline workers. The community focus shown by the Barn Theatre during this time is admirable, and I'm sure we all want to see it maintained for all of us to enjoy after this period is over. Any of you who want to log into this or any of their other events will know that their website is www.barntheatre.org.uk forward slash SOB. That ends. Oh, no, it doesn't. I'm so sorry. We will also be discussing ways in which we can stay connected with our families and friends during this period. We are fortunate that the technology has made it easier than ever and I know people are making the most of it using Zoom and other social networks like House Party for group chats. There is a wide array of innovative apps and websites for all purposes, and I have been using the Tiny Beans app to stay updated with my granddaughter's milestones and memories with pictures and videos. They grow up so fast these days, it would be sad to miss it. Before we start discussing the community action and ideas in more detail, I would like to give a quick update on the latest government action. I'm sure you'll all be absolutely delighted that the Prime Minister has been released from intensive care after responding well to the excellent treatment he's been given at St Thomas's Hospital. Thank you to everyone who has emailed me asking me to pass on their wishes to Boris and Carrie and his family. I hope the Prime Minister is given the time now to fully recover. We have an extremely capable cabinet supported by a very experienced civil servants who are working to a scientifically led step-by-step -step action plan taking the right measures at the right time around the clock. Following extensive lobbying from Gloucestershire MPs, I'm glad to say that a delivery of more than 400,000 items of personal protective equipment arrived in the county on Tuesday night. This was desperately needed by all sections, both the health section, the social care section, care homes, and others in the front line. The PPE will be distributed to 79 different care locations in the county, and more supplies are expected in the coming days. Here, I think I must pay tribute to the army, who are playing a major job in the logistical work of distributing not only PPE, but every other piece of much needed equipment to meet this emergency. The first Secretary of State, Dominic Raab, chaired a COBRA meeting involving the devolved administrations and the Mayor of London to discuss our approach to the revival of social distancing measures. And perhaps again at this uh, point in my opening remarks, it would be as well to stress, please, please apply the social distancing measures during this Easter weekend I know it's very tempting for all of us to want to get together in the countryside or in our own private houses, but it is absolutely vital that we follow the government's guidelines to save lives, maybe even to save our own life. At this stage, the government con con is continuing to gather all of the relevant data to obtain the fullest picture possible of the effects of social distancing measures that we put in place. The government will be guided by the science at all times, so we don't expect to be able to say more on this until at least the end of next week and possibly longer. The measures will have to stay in place until we have the right evidence 
that clearly shows we've moved beyond the peak of this very difficult coronavirus. Government is working with technology firms to help people in care homes stay in touch with their families during this difficult time. As part of this work, Facebook will have provided more than 2,000 of its portal video calling devices for free to hospitals, care homes and other settings, including hospices. The government has reached the target of 10,000 coronavirus tests by the end of March and set a target of 14,000 by the end of April. And I'm delighted to say that they've, they've increased that number of tests to 14,000 this week. They've issued a call for action for manufacturers to produce new ventilators, with the first arriving next week and thousands more in the pipeline, and struck a deal with a, a private hospitals to put another 20,000 staff, 8,000 beds, and 1,200 ventilators at our disposal. They have introduced emergency legislation to help control the spread of COVID-19 with a £31 billion package of support from our public service, to our public services, individuals and businesses. Overall, the help will, including the statutory six pay costs for small and medium-sized businesses, and a £500 million hardship fund to support economically vulnerable people and households. Overall, that package, with the loans available, the interruption loans available to businesses large and small, will amount to well over £300 billion. That is an enormous amount of money to meet an unprecedented crisis. And now I look forward to hearing of some really heartbreaking and really fantastic actions taken by communities and individuals around Gloucestershire. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey, and thank you, uh, John, for your very moving words, um, which I think will touch a lot of people, whether they are religious or not. And certainly, I'd um, like to add my thanks to Sir Geoffrey for you taking the time to, to come here. And just a word on, on John's, John's schedule, uh, for those that don't know, Vickers are very busy at this time, not just thinking about Easter, but John, when he agreed to do this, also sadly has got three funerals that he's got to deal with. And as he said, they're testing at the best of times, but they're much more testing now when you're dealing with a whole different set of circumstances for people who can't join their loved ones uh, at a funeral. And we're very grateful for you taking the time out and um, pass on our best wishes and our condolences to those families, uh, some of whom I know, and um, I, I wish them all very, very best. As far as this process is concerned, it's very similar to what we've done before. I, we've invited people to write in to us, and they've done that either directly to you, Sir Geoffrey, because you were very kind to release your email address, and to um, the generic email address that we've been using, which is Cotswold Speaks. And at the same time, we're hoping that during this session, people will actually um, send us, as they have done before, um, their thoughts and their ideas via um, live streaming. This is in not in any way, as you've said, to replace the question and answer session. There are some questions, and Sir Geoffrey has said that if there's time at the end, he'll certainly address those questions. So we're not wanting you to stop sending your questions. It's just that today we're trying to look um, forward at some of the wonderful ideas, bearing in mind that we have probably got the most unusual, Chris, uh, most unusual Easter uh, ahead of us. And as Sir Geoffrey has already said, we've got um, quite a few days, possibly weeks, where we've got to continue to um, isolate ourselves, social distance, and so on. So without further ado, I think a good place to start, because they've been very humble in the way in which they have acknowledged their own contribution. I think it would be really good to add to what you've already said, Sir Geoffrey, about the Barn Theatre. And what we've now come to know as the Barn Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, which David, in my opinion... I always opinion, knew you'd get a job at the BBC. <laughs> Well, I don't think the Barn Theatre will ever give me a job, but there you go. <laughs> um, they've done a fantastic job. They have literally built a television st uh, station in their uh, theatre from nothing in the course of the time that they've had since they've shut. And they've got some wonderful programming, which you can see um, on Facebook, and the audiences are growing um, day by day. But this is all done for free, and the Barn Theatre is at the top of the list in terms of the organisations in the Cotswolds that needs help needs donations, needs support. 
People might think because the Barn Theatre is a registered charity that it gets help from the government. And there was a recent announcement of £750 million um, money being made available to um, charities. The Barn Theatre is not one of those charities. They rely on our generosity and our support. So if you can continue to support the Barn Theatre, that would be great. And then they'll be able to continue to do what they're doing and fulfilling a huge gap and providing this facility for us and for um, all sorts of really uh, wonderful um, people. And long may it continue. So big thank you to you, the yeah. guys out there behind the screen. Thank you very much. <laughs> the first um, email that we've received, um, Sir Geoffrey, um, and the idea is that I'm going to discuss this and then invite the two of you to comment. Um, this is a coronavirus update um, from the uh, uh, amazing Cotswold Friends, volunteers and staff. Over 2,000 people are being supported by our amazing Cotswold Friends, volunteers and staff. Charity services have been adapted in the light of recent coronavirus um, issues telephone befriending, shopping, pharmacy deliveries and transport for vital journeys are all in place and fully operational. Cotswold Friends is a local charity helping and supporting older and vulnerable people in the North Cotswolds. The aim is to combat loneliness and isolation. And um, there's a useful phone number here, which is um, 01608 651 415. And as before, when we get given useful email addresses and phone numbers, we'll make them available. So I don't know if you, Sir Geoffrey, have had any experience of Cotswold Friends since they set up and whether you'd like to um, add some thoughts to the Cotswold Friends service. Well, David, thank you very much for... Uh um, bringing uh, everybody's attention to the Cotswold Friends. Uh, they do a fantastic job in the North Cotswolds. Uh, the Cotswolds, as a constituency, tends to have a fairly elderly dem demographic, and therefore the need for volunteers is all the greater. And f I am incredibly fortunate. There are a huge range, and I'm sure John would like to say in a minute or two, of organisations in the Cotswolds that give generously of their time to volunteer to help people who are less fortunate than themselves. The coronavirus is a particularly difficult time for some of our elderly and vulnerable people, and therefore the need for this type of volunteering is ever greater. So I can only say a very sincere thank you to Cotswold Friends. Anybody who can help support them by volunteering, although I do think over this whole coronavirus, the various volunteering groups have been uh, well and truly had a large number of people volunteering uh, and the people who need help. Um, as far as I am aware, pretty nearly universally have got it. But again, if there is somebody, um, as I had at the beginning, but not lately, if there is somebody who is vulnerable and hasn't had help, then please either get in touch with one of the volunteering groups or indeed myself or indeed John, as he's already said in his opening remarks. He has lots of networks he can call on. John. Yeah. John, would you like to comment on that? Because not necessarily about Cotswold Friends, but how that can dovetail in with the things you referred to in your um, opening remarks about the service that the church and other um, groups can offer the community. I mean, there's been a huge generosity of spirit in so many ways. And one of the wonderful things that I've, I've found is um, the number of people who have offered to volunteer and help people locally. Um, and that was happening very quickly. One of the advantages, actually, of living in a rural area um, is that we have town and parish councils and um, people who are very rooted in their community and know, and we know each other quite well, generally speaking. Um, so we've been able to identify where support may, may be needed. Um, in the Antonys, we've already got 50 volunteers very quickly. Um, I've just sent them an email in the last day sort of apologising that I've not been able to put them to greater work yet. Um, but we have had people needing prescriptions collected, some shopping done. The Cotswold District Council Community Safety Team got in contact to ask about uh, an elderly person in one of the villages who they were particularly concerned about. We were able to deal with that immediately. And our local uh, postman um, happened to be delivering some posts to me the other day and said he'd come across someone who he was concerned about and we were able to follow that up. So actually having those networks is absolutely fabulous. The one thing that I would say though is that 
some people can be a little bit proud about asking for help. Mm. And even today I've heard of someone who was calling their daughter in London saying that they've not been able to get anyone to do their shopping. Yet if they'd only just asked locally, that, that support is ready on hand. That person's now been sorted out and all is well. Um, but I would just say to anyone who needs help, this is the moment to ask for it because there is help at hand. Thank you very much. And yes, I know we joke in, in our village that actually there are more helpers than there are people who actually need, um, need the help. But you're absolutely right. Um, people who are having to be socially isolated over 70 and they, don't, they really are not used to asking for help. And um, it's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. David, and if I may just interrupt. It's not just the people over 70. No, of course. There are plenty of other vulnerable people yeah. who've got a yeah. health condition, maybe, or yeah. some other problem. And they should, or as John says, please never be too proud to ask for help. There's always a time in all of our lives when we could all do with a little extra help. If now is the time you need help, please ask someone. Okay. Well, that leads neatly on to the next um, email that came to you, Geoffrey, and this is from the government um, official WhatsApp information service, Gov UK WhatsApp information service. This service aims to provide official, trustworthy, I think that's important because there's a lot of misinformation going around at the moment, so to provide official, trustworthy and timely information and advice about coronavirus, COVID-19, and will further reduce the burden on the NHS services. This will help combat the spread of coronavirus misinformation in the UK, as well as helping ensure people stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. The Government UK Coronavirus Information Service is an automated chat box service, which will allow the British public to get answers to the most common questions about coronavirus direct from government. To use the free gov.uk coronavirus information service on WhatsApp, simply add 07860064422 in your phone contacts and then message the word hi in a WhatsApp message to get started. A set of menu options is then presented which the user can choose from and then be sent relevant guidance from gov.uk pages as well as links to gov.uk for further information. I think what this does is highlights the issue of misinformation. You made the point about the post service. There's a lot of misinformation going around about whether you can touch your letters, or whether you have to wash them, or whether you have to um, wear gloves, etc., etc. I don't know if you've got any observations, Sir Geoffrey, on the official government uh, coronavirus information service and the work the government's doing to get its message out officially. Well, you've uh, mentioned the app. I've mentioned the app in previous uh, sessions. The, the gov.uk website has uh, about 20 pages of all the various help that the government has given to different individuals and organisations throughout this crisis, and it's well worth a look if you uh, want to know that information. Um, there is a daily press conference uh, from number 10, which gives the very latest advice, um, particularly from the chief medical officer, uh, and the chief uh, uh, health officer. Um, so that, is, that gives the very latest advice, and they will be looking at the uh, tracking the spread of the virus and working out what exact measures are needed to be put in place at the exact stage of the progress of the virus. And uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's a little too soon yet to know precisely when we're going to be able to start to ease these restrictions. Um, but, but it is important that people stay up to date with the latest information from the government. Have you got any observations, John, on the government's, uh, the official image? Are you experiencing people contacting you, being confused about, about the actual, what the official information is and where to go? And have you had any experience of that government, um, Facebook? I'm afraid I, you, you have an avowed Luddite in front of you. Um, so all of that sort of thing. I tend to get my daughter to do, if I'm honest, uh, but I'm having to learn to use technology. Um, my source of information, frankly, is the regular news from the BBC or ITV. Um, and my slight fear, dare I say, is that there is an awful lot of information. And at the moment, most of us just need to know, stay at home. If you're going out, stay a good two metres away from each other and wash your hands and wash your hands and wash your hands. Thank you very much. There will always be people or organisations 
who don't fit into the government guidelines, and we've had many hundreds of them email us. If you have a problem and it doesn't seem to fit into the guidelines, please don't hesitate to email me. And in many cases, I've been able to find an answer for those people. Moving on, I mean, we all know that a lot of our lives have been curtailed by um, key centres being closed, not least the churches uh, over e Easter. Um, I, I had someone speak to me earlier where she was very distressed that she wasn't actually able to go to church at 3, 3 p.m. So I told her to listen to your broadcast. Um, so, but other things, um, such as maintaining levels of fitness, which I think is important to all of us, and the government's trying to make sure that we all go out and that we don't lie down and have a suntan, we actually do carry on walking. But just um, to give a plug for um, our own leisure services here in the Cotswolds, Everyone Active, um, uh, and you can go to their um, site, which is news at everyoneactivelivecommunications.co.uk. They've got some really useful ways about how you can kick off Easter weekend before you get stuck into the Easter eggs to keep fit. For youngsters, you can try and act like an animal, walk like a duck, jump, stretch, do things to mirror, mirror animals. There's uh, initiatives on there for older kids, uh, for grown-ups, for the really grown-ups to check out senior channel on on-demand workouts. And you can get connected through live classes, get involved through in sessions and um, work out. It says here, it's quite interesting. Read this. It takes two. Try this with your partner and have a workout with your partner uh, during the quarantine weekend. It gives you some guidance as to how you can do that. Um, so do look out for their website and, and do take care. Um, there are various initiatives on here, which I won't read out, but they are available and they'll be available after here. Have you, have you done any virtual workouts, either of you, since, um, since this kicked in? No, my, my uh, daily exercise is usually to go for a good walk uh, on my own. Um, and it, it, is a, it is a great way to keep fit. But there are lots of other ways, cycling and I, I, running and uh, exercises in the home. There's plenty of ways to keep fit um, if people want to do that. You got any thoughts on keeping fit, John, virtually or otherwise? Well, I have to say, my my keeping fit is doing a bit of gardening. I, I'm doing. We, we've got a, a veg patch which I'm spending an hour in every morning digging over. Slowly but surely, we're getting there. It's never looked so good. And um, walking. So we we have a daily walk as a family as as we're together. And I have watched Joe Wicks on the television and felt so much better. <laughs> Well, you, you both look in excellent shape, actually, so well so do done, you. both of you. So do you. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the things that someone did write in to us and said it was so refreshing is seeing people walking their dogs from their front door rather than getting into their car with their dog, going to some beauty spot, um, polluting the planet, spending some money on some diesel, whereas now, um, you know, it's, it's great to see people actually going for a walk just down through the village yeah. or um, around a, a recognised... Uh, footpath um, across the field but of course that brings with it issues to do with farming at this difficult time when they're planting their crops. We've now got a very interesting email Jeffrey um, and uh, John from um, the North Cotswolds so I'm going to read it out if I may in its entirety. Good morning sorry for the delay in coming back to you when the devastating this is from Declan um, when the devastating effects of COVID-19 first appeared here in the UK and more locally in the Cotswolds entire communities sprung into action the caring for each other and the help of our neighbours really took the centre stage. Volunteer groups sprung up in every corner of the Cotswolds. One of these was created in the small village of Upper Rissington under the stewardship of the Parish Council, which you've mentioned just now, the importance of Parish Councils in our community. The ethos was simply to care for the vulnerable in the community and to reassure these people that they are not alone. The goal was simple. If a single person could be assisted, then it would be, all would be worthwhile. However, since launch, the responses from the residents of Upper Rissington has been more than anyone could have hoped for. There were a huge number of residents who signed up immediately to assist with the programme. They were DBS checked, signed agreements which laid out procedures on what help we could offer and how to help guide was produced. Quite a number of vulnerable people were also identified. This list is growing daily. All these people were made to immediately feel at ease, knowing that their needs were, not, were now being covered. They are now getting daily calls and texts, having their shopping done for them and prescriptions collected. There are also a range of online classes being offered to all, including yoga alongside services being offered by local professionals to help deal with the stresses and anxieties which currently exist. Put simply, we have wrapped up 
all of those vulnerable people with the care and compassion that Upper Rissington has to offer. They feel secure in the knowledge that there are a huge number of people here ready and willingly able to help them. Each one has been given the direct phone number of their local street champion. That's a really interesting idea. Um, the street champion idea. It is important for these people simply to know we are here to help. We in Upper Risington, along with all our other local communities, feel very proud of our village and we are immensely proud of the residents who care so much. Would you like to comment on the whole concept, as you said, John, about living in the country and the whole concept of how villages are getting together and whether you've experienced um, the Upper Rissington factor in any of the villages that you both, um, well, you live in Daglingworth, you live in the Ampney. So would you like to comment on it, John? Certainly in Fairford, they've divided the town up into sort of zones where, and, and there are people in, in, in that zone that you can contact. Um, and, and, and whether eyes are being kept out. And I, th I think the answer has to be local because different communities need different approaches. And um, so, so, so I think what might work in a, in, a, in a larger town in a more formal way, in a very small village where, you know, like Amney St Mary, there's a, a, a group of people who, who are keeping an eye out for each other. And that's great. Um, and I, I think it's horses for courses, but the, the, the one theme that runs through all of this is just the generosity of spirit and the willingness to, uh, to, to, to work together. And I hope, dare I say, Sir Geoffrey, that perhaps this time next year there might be a sort of, I don't know, a, a Community Endeavour Award 2020 of some description where people can be thanked who went that extra mile sort of in the voluntary sector. You I think that's thoughts? incredibly that's good. That's a idea. really good idea. Really good idea. And uh, we will put that into operation. I will somehow make it happen. And uh, if people could store up suitable candidates for such an award so that when the coronavirus is over, we can, we can find out or decide what the award should be. But we've also got some good entries uh, to go in for it. So I think that's a fantastic idea. Upper Risington is an interesting community. It, it, it was a smallish community after the army left the base and in the last uh, five to seven years it has expanded massively and so it is a relatively new community and therefore people won't necessarily know people who are either living next door to them or certainly in their streets it's got new shops it's got a new school so it is an entirely new community and it had its teething problems when it was being built but my impression is that those uh, physical teething problems are now largely over and Declan, I think your initiative is fantastic. You sent me fuller details than David has read out. Um, and I think what you and the parish councillor managed to achieve in Upper Risington is, is really amazing. And I think what it will do is it will bring your community together for, the, for their benefit long after this coronavirus is over because everybody will be aware of everybody else. And where people get their... Uh, if, as it were, hands well involved in an endeavour like this, I don't know whether John would agree with this, somehow afterwards they become much closer uh, friends and colleagues. So well done for what you're doing, keep at it, and I'm sure all of those people you're helping in Upper Risington, and I hope that when you've done Upper Risington, you might expand it to some of the villages, if they want it, surrounding you. That's great, thank you. I mean, there's been quite a lot of research done on mental health and well-being in terms of volunteering and helping other people. And time after time, the findings are is that doing a good turn for someone else and not thinking about yourself, but thinking about someone else is actually really good for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that the Sciences Chamber of Commerce, who are streaming this event, we had a meeting by Zoom, which was something I hadn't heard of uh, three or four weeks ago. Um, and one of our... Um, committee members there um, is, is someone who deals in keeping your mind fit and she's going to do a thought for the day on the Chamber of Commerce website because as she said one of the big issues at the moment is it's not just physical fitness it's the ability to continue to you know we're, we're all suffering a lot from a lack of, uh, of human contact. Um, here's a nice, a nice short one. This is uh, the creation of a neighbourhood volunteer card in Borton on the Water. Received in Borton on the Water on the first day of lockdown from a neighbour. On this street we have one main contact, which is the idea of the street champion, who's given her number out to every household in that street. 
Also, we have a neighbour WhatsApp group used yesterday to deliver essential supplies to neighbours who are isolating due to age. It's quite a nice idea, this street champion idea, particularly in the bigger conurbations. I don't think we need to comment on that, just accept that comment for, um, for what it is. Um, Again, David, they're, they're doing a fantastic effort in Borton and they should be well thanked for what they're doing. Um, we've got a situation here which is the GCC Community Help Hub, which is another important organisation. We've talked about the government's help, but I don't think we can uh, move off this session without acknowledging the contributions both of the District Council and their live streaming event um, on Tuesdays, which is quite informative, and dovetails neatly in with, with your uh, Friday afternoon sessions. Sir Geoffrey, but also Gloucester County Council have launched a brilliant community hub in partnership with all the local councils, uh, the health services and the police. In these challenging and unprecedented times, we need to support each other. You can use this website if you need help, and I'll um, read it out. It's uh, www. Um, I think I gave you one too many W's then. What, www. Gloucestershire.gov.uk forward slash Gloucestershire's uh, Community Help Hub easily usable. This um, will enable you to get support that you can provide, um, including help for food shopping, taking the bins out, um, being available for a friendly chat during what could be a very isolating period for many. If you are unable to use the online forms, we have a phone line available. Please call 01452 583 519. How refreshing for someone to enable you to have a phone number rather than just going online. Um, this is a priority telephone line for people who need help and who are volunteering. Please do not use it for reporting other issues. The Community Help Hub is open as usual this week, Easter weekend. If you or someone you know needs help, call 01452 583 519 and the lines are open through Good Friday, Saturday, Sunday and indeed Easter Monday. That's really good to hear because if you're isolated during the week at Easter, it can be even more isolating would you like to comment on, on that helpline, John? Have you c come across anybody that's used the Gloucestershire uh, County Council um, helpline? We've fed into it. Um, so, so we've passed our information for the groups that we've got in our villages to the, the community hub. And c can I just echo um, the thanks that we do need to give to Cotswold District Council and Gloucestershire County Council for the work that's going on behind the scenes. So, in my previous life, I, I worked for a, a district council in, in Surrey and was involved in emergency planning and dealing with smaller scale um, issues when, when they arose. And I know the amount of work that goes unseen but in the background. Um, and be kind and be patient with people working for the council and in shops um, because they're doing their best and we don't always know what they're having to do likewise with our doctors who are under a great deal of pressure at the moment. Be kind. That's great. Have you got any observations yes, on the... Yes, David. Outline? One of my um, big parts of what I've been doing during this uh, uh, coronavirus is to keep in touch with all the various different agencies, uh, with the police, with the health agencies, with the county, district and town councils. And I think we're very fortunate here in Gloucestershire how well the agencies work together, uh, dealing with problems as they've arisen, uh, protective clothing being one of them, that the Gloucestershire MPs then took up with Matt Hancock, the Secretary of State, and managed to get a, a, a bigger delivery than we'd had before. So um, I, I do think the County Council setting up this hub on the volunteering side, and I think when uh, the whole of this episode is disseminated afterwards, I think we will be amazed at how much volunteering has gone up and down, on up and down, uh, both in the Cotswolds and in Gloucestershire as a whole. And a great tribute must be paid to the Gloucestershire Hub because they are the people that have drawn this all together, make sure that there's enough supplies out there for people who want to volunteer, give them the information to keep not only the volunteers safe, but also the people they're helping safe. And that's been really important. So, yep, well done, Gloucestershire Hub. You've done a great job. Okay. Um, the, the, the idea behind this session um, was that we would not only look at ideas within um, the Cotswolds and be able to share those so that people can springboard off them and perhaps use them and hopefully 
contact us and um, the number of questions we're getting in or rather the number of ideas we're getting in. I, hope we, I think we ought to have another one of these sessions because it is extremely useful, particularly to get your respective insights into it rather than just reading out a statement here. But also we've got some input from uh, neighbouring authorities um, as well. Um, and here's Stroud. They've got a thing called the Long Table in Stroud. It's a community kitchen cooking uh, freshly made healthy ready meals in microwavable degradable containers. And for £25 you get seven meals and there is a pay it forward option for those who cannot afford it now. I've not come across the pay it forward idea, but that's quite a nice idea. Target recipients are people self-isolating with funds um, who want affordable, tasty and nutritious meals for their household. People whose carers can no longer visit them as the carers are self-isolating. I have a neighbour who's in exactly that situation. She's in a wheelchair and her daughter has had to completely reschedule her um, caring package. People who are nervous about going into public or being asked to minimise contact as they are over 70. People who need help but can't afford support but are identified by organisations and charities who want to draw down a free meal. And the website for that is um, www.thelongtableonline.com. Just order or call your local phone number and there's a phone number there for Stroud um, District Council. But interesting, before I know you're going to say it, Sir Geoffrey, part of Stroud is actually part of your constituency. So um, Cotswolds, there's a phone number there as well, 01285 323 851, um, where you can take advantage of the Cotswold at thelongtableonline.com. Have you had any experience of um, either that organisation or, or, or really the provision of meals? I've got one you'll be interested to know, John, from the Crown of Crucis, who've sent us in some information on their um, food boxes. But have you come across this food box idea um, in, in the constituency, Sir Geoffrey? Yes. Um, part of the um, uh, ability of being able to relax the planning application, uh, planning regulations is that some of our, club, our pubs have been able to uh, prepare takeaway meals um, and that has been a, a of benefit where they're doing it and it's also helped to keep some of their staff employed in that operation it's not a, a complete substitute for what they would normally be doing as a business but it has been uh, helpful to do to a degree so yes there are quite a number of uh, our hostelries up and down the constituency offering either free meals or at least uh, takeaway uh, meals for those that don't always want to cook for themselves. So again, a whole part of what goes on that we wouldn't necessarily see at first sight. Have you had the experience of this, John? The, the, there is an, another, and I think related group called Feeding the 5000 that the Bishop is supporting. And I believe there's a kitchen at the RAU um, being used to make meals, freeze them, and then they're being delivered seven meals at, at a time to people in need uh, across across the uh, across this area um, and they can be given free to those who are in real need or you can actually buy meals um, if you want to buy some meals in and, and can afford to do so and uh, we're looking for volunteers to help uh, transport those um, meals to people in the district so that's a similar project to the one in Stroud actually happening here uh, in Sirencester and elsewhere. I think it's all part of the same family. And uh, the Crown of Crucis in, uh, in Amni Crucis, um, the hotel there um, has really got involved with, with the community and wanting to support. And they're putting together, because they've been able to buy stuff wholesale, and are putting together sort of food boxes that people in the village can actually buy. Um, yeah, they've got one especially for Easter, and it's a, I think they're calling it a non, non, not-for-profit yeah, um, food box. It's yeah. not free, but it means they're not making any, any money right. on it. And they, she was worried when I spoke to her earlier today that if we mentioned it here, they might suddenly be inundated. But she said she has got to plug for the Crown of Cruces. They've got about 15 of their boxes left. So if anyone's near the Crown, and it's an essential journey, if you're actually walking in Anthony Cruces, there are still some available there. Looks really exciting idea. I'm told by those who understand these things that they're actually quite good value for money as well. Yeah. Right, okay. The uh, County Council tell us that there are about 9,000 people in the county that need to um, self-isolate because they are vulnerable, which would imply that there's about 1,500 in the Cotswolds that will need to self-isolate. So we need to make sure that one way or another, all these wonderful volunteering groups that we are talking about, coordinated by the Gloucestershire Hub, 
absolutely we are really catching all of those in every community. Okay. Just want to change pace a bit, if you'll allow me, because um, having looked at the micro, it might be worth just revisiting um, something to do with the NHS. And we all know about the incredible response that the NHS got from the volunteer scheme that has been frozen as they process 750,000 applicants. The volunteers began reporting for duty this week, and they'd like us to just to give an update today on, on the position there. Um, as what they're called community response volunteers, delivering food, medicine and essential supplies, patient transport volunteers, NHS transport volunteers, and check-in and chat volunteers. So you can, you can volunteer at all sorts of levels. NHS volunteer responders have been set up to support the NHS and the care sector during the COVID-19 outbreak. To do this, we need an army of volunteers who can support vulnerable people in England who are most risk to the virus. Um, our doctors, nurses, etc. Those people in local authorities and other professionals will be able to refer people into the volunteer um, responders scheme and be confident that they have been matched with a reliable named volunteer. Um, I don't know where we can actually get hold of the details of the volunteers that are in the Cotswolds or in our individual patches, but the programme enables volunteers to provide care or to help a vulnerable person, which is permitted under the new rules announced by the government on the 23rd of March. And then it goes on to say that the volunteers must be over a certain age and that safety is a priority and patient transport drivers need to have a DBS check and so on. But um, are you in a position to perhaps update us on the NHS situation with this, Sir Geoffrey, and how it's going to manifest itself in the, cat, in the Cotswolds? Well, Have this you got gives some me thoughts? An ideal moment to pay tribute to about 10,000 nurses and about four to 5,000 doctors who have volunteered, either they've been retired or they're working elsewhere, to go back into the health service uh, to help with the, this coronavirus. This is really very noble because they will be right at the front line dealing with people in this crisis. In Gloucestershire, I know we've got 22 retired doctors who have specially volunteered for the Easter weekend in case there is a real problem over the weekend. So to all those out there, of course, those that work regularly in the health service and the social care sector, but all those who have volunteered, who've retired, who thought they would never be working again to come back and do this vital service is a very important uh, and, and, and well, uh, really deserving um, uh, cause. So, David, sorry, I, with that little diversion, I was, what was your exact Well, well uh, it was more for you to comment on the fact that we've, it's, it's one of the themes that we've picked up over the last three or four weeks. The announcements from government um, about money being available, and in this instance about the NHS Community Volunteer Scheme, but how is that going to present itself in terms of the Cotswolds and how are people going to be able to identify where they go for help? Um, and I'm going to ask John to comment on it as well, because I know it's there. I know they've got 750,000 people who have signed up. But if you've got an issue in a particular village or, or a town in the Cotswolds, how, how are we going to be able to take advantage of that? Right. Have you got any well, uh, updates? I think the, the, the NHS volunteer scheme is now closed because they've had so many volunteers uh, and the number of people that they need to look after is they don't need more volunteers in the NHS scheme. So what has actually happened is that the Gloucestershire Hub have liaised with the NHS and they have a handle on, uh, I think, where most of the volunteering in the county is going. So if there's a particular problem in a particular area, I think the answer is probably to ring that or ring or get online to the Gloucestershire Volunteering Hub on the uh, number okay. and uh, website that you've yeah. read out. Have you any, any experience of it so far, John, or is it too early days from your point? Do you know anybody in, in your communities that's actually signed up? Uh, my, I know my daughter's volunteered and I suspect there will be other people who's volu who volunteered and the NHS will have been over overwhelmed with volunteers and just managing that as a process, you know, is, is, is a challenge in itself. But that's, that's, they're getting on with that. I think, believe they're focused on those people who've received the letter saying, actually, you're in the vulnerable category, you need to stay in, you need to look after yourself. And those people will be supported by this group of volunteers. And as there's a surplus of them, I'm sure through the hub we'll be able to draw on them too. And there are plenty of volunteers out in our community as well, as first responders supporting um, the ambulance service. You know, and they're, they're, they're right at the front line. And I know, certainly know a few of them. I was interested in, on, on, on television last night, there were two doctors who'd literally qualified six months ago and were suddenly 
presented with the COVID-19 um, situation and they said, you know, it really was very challenging for them. But um, without uh, giving a, a plug about your daughter, your daughter's training to be a nurse, a, a, a doctor, isn't yeah. she? And, and how far down her course is she and when, when, she, when will she qualify? Well, does she have any, what are her thoughts? It'd be interested to know what she's thinking about this awful virus and how she's well, aiming to help. Well, I hope her thoughts are on her dissertation at the moment, <laughs> but um, she, she starts her fourth year uh, in September. And um, one of the, the jokes that we've had in our house is that we think she'll be, because in their fourth and fifth year, they're on, on the wards most of the time. Oh, right. Um, at, as part of their professional practice and experience. And uh, in January, February time, it's highly likely she's going to be on a maternity ward. And we've been joking that she's going to be very busy because uh, that's <laughs> nine months after the lockdown started. So there just might be a bit of a baby boom then. Yeah, we're going to have another group of baby boomers. You never know. Yeah. Um, so, some of us are former baby boomers. But, 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 but young, young uh, her, her, the, 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 the students in year five... Um, have had their graduations brought forward. Um, right. I don't think there was a. I don't think they had a ceremony as such. And they're now interim um, foundation doctors on wards um, in Leeds. Um, so you know, youngsters at the age of 25 are right in the front line as well. You know, learning on the job as uh, as they go, providing support um, to you know doctors who've been qualified for very much longer. Well, thank you for that, and that's a really exciting uh, opportunity for her. But um, I'm not putting a plea in for people to go off and pr produce more children. <laughs> but I did hear that it's going to be uh, one of the ways you could occupy yourself, I suppose, um, unless you're so self-isolating. Um, right. Uh, but David, my uh, daughter-in-law is due to give birth in June. And I would like to say that to all those mums that are about to give birth during this coronavirus, it's, uh, and we feel for you because uh, in my daughter-in-law's case, she's been told that my son might not necessarily be able to be present at the birth. Oh, God, yeah. So this is a difficult time for them. And I hope all those that are giving birth during this crisis, uh, it all goes smoothly. Well, we did, we did actually get an observation from um, one of the district councillors, which John um, was going to comment on, and I think I may as well, it's a perfect opportunity to mention it here, where she wanted us to um, say um, on the live stream to spare a thought for people who are in that situation, just about to give birth, people who've had to have their weddings postponed, um, or going ahead just with a couple of people, and of course, um, the awful situation with funerals where you've got very low, um, you can't have very many people attending the funeral. I don't know if you've got any thoughts there, John, because you did see that email and I wondered if you'd make any, uh, an observation on the things yeah. that you tend to do as a, as a vicar uh, when it comes to things like baptisms and weddings and, and funerals. Yeah, it's so, very so, difficult for you. So, so, so in terms of what we're able practically to do, um, baptisms, can only be done in an emergency um, and, and certainly not in church. Um, weddings, we've had to postpone uh, quite a few, a, a number of wedding couples were contacting me fair early on to say, well, actually, we, we think we need to postpone our wedding. And then, of course, it came in that, that we weren't allowed to take weddings because of the social isolation uh, issues. Um, and so weddings aren't taking place across the country at all at the moment. Um, and things have been put back either, a, you know, a good six months, nine months, a year. Um, and that's been quite a struggle for um, young, young couples um, who have had to renegotiate with wedding venues, so on and so forth. Actually, probably the church bit is the easiest bit to rearrange and the least costly element of a wedding, dare I say. Um, so that bit's sortable. It, it, it's all the issues around photographers and, and yeah, others yeah, providing... Yeah providing services that's been an, um, an anxious making time. But particularly, I have a, a real heart for those who are going to be having to deal with funerals into the future currently. Um, different crematoria have got different approaches. So at Kingsdown Crematoria, um, we are allowed to have 10 people in the chapel um, for a service and everyone has to be spread out um, and I'm dealing with bereaved families where I would normally go and visit, do a personal visit, 
and get to know the family if I don't know them already. Um, that's all having to happen over the phone and also by email, which doesn't feel satisfactory. Um, but it's great that people understand and we all, we're all doing what we can. Um, but the hardest, actually, is when people go into hospital because they will be going on their own yeah. and family will not be allowed in. Um, and that, uh, and again, I would want to say to everyone, you know, be kind to doctors and nurses and they're doing their best. And, very, and, and, and I've heard on the television a few times, you know, well, so-and-so died alone. That's not my experience. Um, they may have died without their family around them, but actually our nursing staff are incredibly good at being with someone who's dying. Um, so we're, everyone who works in, in a hospital or at an undertaker's or, or wherever, they're all human beings as well, and uh, they're under pressure. So this is a moment where we just all need to be gracious and just think about that other person and their circumstances as well as our own. Have you got any thoughts? Well, I think that John's message, which he's now repeated twice, be kind, uh, goes right across this whole coronavirus. And, and I'm sure John would agree, 95, 6% of the community are doing just that. Mm. It's just the odd person who is quite unreasonable. And uh, I would just say to everybody, just think twice um, about the other person at the other side of the till, or as you say, when you have to hand that relative over to the hospital or whatever. Um, they are all doing their best under very, very difficult circumstances. They may have been working uh, very long shifts. Um, they are under great pressure too. They have been at the front line dealing very closely uh, hopefully with the right protective clothing with people who've got the, vir the virus and sadly some of those will die. So this is a difficult um, episode for some of our people at the front line and they deserve our enduring thanks. And I, d I think we may have seen the same programme last night where there was a, um, a family who'd lost, um, a son who'd lost his father who was in his 80s to coronavirus and they were able to communicate using, using mobile phones. But he said it was a great comfort to him and to his wife and to his children that his father didn't die alone because the nurses were there and that they were friends and they acted as an extended family. Mm. So it's another dimension of the NHS that we possibly, we think of them from all their professional and clinical skills, but they're also, they are there and they're risking their lives, but they're there at that moment when perhaps we as relatives can't be there. John, I thought about this question as I was going to sleep last night, and I would like to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. If you were taking a funeral, would it be possible to have a sort of conference, phone call type funeral, so that those that were not able to be admitted into the crematorium could at least hear your words of comfort um, during the service? Yeah, yes, they're, they're doing live streaming of funerals uh, from the crematoria. Um, and actually, one... Graham Morris, who's the vicar of uh, Siren Sister, was telling me that he actually went to a, a, a was taking a funeral uh, somewhere where um, the family all needed to self-isolate quite strictly, um, and that th 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 they were in, in deep mourning and wanted to pay their respects. And they drove to the they drove to the crematoria, and they followed the hearse, and the service took place with Graham in the crematoria. Um, but the family stayed outside in their different cars and watched it on their laptops or on their, on their mobile phones. Um, and that, that can be organised and can be done. And it's also done very discreetly, so um, one needs to know the details and the funeral director, and you contact the funeral director who then will give you access to the live streaming. So. Um, you know, you and I just can't hack in to watch someone else's funeral. Mm. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Just uh, okay, getting back to um, the website, I hope. <laughs> but whilst I'm trying to do that, um, I may need... There we go. Um, right. Um, I'm just checking the live stream. Um, what's interesting about the live stream is that You've established such a, a concept here, Sir Geoffrey, that people are still wanting to ask you questions as opposed to present ideas. I know we were going to try and allocate a little bit of time at the end, end for that, but um, 
this is really a plug, and I, uh, it's an interesting one because we were talking um, earlier about this is spring and how beautiful it is that uh, the flowers are coming out and this whole concept of Easter and rebirth. And um, for those of us that enjoy Siren Sester's um, floral um, uh, offer, whereby the Phoenix Gardeners um, display 30 hanging baskets throughout um, the spring and summer, and uh, I've had a request to say on air, um, the 30 hanging baskets, they've gone ahead and they've actually purchased them, but normally they'd be able to go to local businesses and uh, get an opportunity for them to sponsor the um, individual hanging baskets. And of course, for, for all sorts of reasons, they can't do that at the moment. So it's a plea that the 30 baskets in the marketplace normally cost about 1,800 pounds. And if you as an individual or a local business are, are watching here and would like to um, contribute and have a hanging basket, then um, Meg Blunson, who organises it, is a great stalwart in the town. She'd love to hear from you on 01285 657 696. But uh, the flowers in, in uh, Siren Sister are, are wonderful. And she then sent me a follow-up email, which was to say that what they're hoping to do is to go above and beyond um, the normal tributes that they put up in Siren Sester and to um, see if they could actually do something over and above that um, and actually uh, celebrate the end of the coronavirus um, uh, lockdown. So she's saying here, I'm raising this issue and I hope that on behalf of the community we can brighten up the marketplace and come up with some other wonderful floral tributes. More about that um, anon. Okay? Um, so she wants to, she's calling it Cheer Up Siren Sister, which I thought was quite a nice, uh, a nice idea. Um. So David, back in the day when we did have elections in the spring, one of the great joys of an election, and I, this is not just an anecdote made up, it, it, those of you who, who, who canvass with me will have often heard me say one of the great joys is to go round and see the most wonderful gardens, and some of them are just an odd square yard or two, and others of them are bigger. But the work and the ingenuity and the skill that goes into these gardens and the variety of the plants in the gardens are just fantastic. And, I, and I'm sure that many people are now getting great joy from their plants, whether they're in their gardens or whether they're in their houses. And uh, that is a great comfort to many people. Okay. Um, we've all talked in the past about how excited we were to get the growth hub here in Siren Sister. And... Um, the irony of the Growth Hub is that they're there to help start up businesses. And one of the themes that occurred in the last three sessions is start up businesses are perhaps more vulnerable because they haven't got three years worth of trading history. And the Growth Hub wanted us to say that these are unusual and worrying times for every one of us with impacts that touch every single aspect of our daily lives. Whilst the absolute priority throughout the period is the health, safety and welfare of our families, friends and loved ones, we also know that to emerge from the other side of this pandemic, we must do everything we can to keep Gloucestershire businesses in business, which is the thing that really prompted this session as to how can we help people going forward. Across the Gloucestershire Growth Hub network, our teams have been working hard to deal with the hundreds of business support inquiries that they're getting, acting as a conduit from G First LEP to Gloucestershire businesses, our teams are available um, to give you the very latest information and resources that we can offer, signposting and referral solutions that we know businesses are very grateful. Our blog be below highlights just how we are able to support your business in these challenging times. Our message is simple. If you're looking for guidance for your business, whether COVID-19 related or business as usual, we are here for you and we'll provide that information. Have you, um, have you got any thoughts on the Growth Hub? I have, David. I, I went round fairly soon after it had opened, and I was amazed by the number of both little tiny businesses and bigger businesses that were beginning to use this facility, which is basically a space where there's an opportunity with a phone and a computer for somebody to base a, a temporary office. Um, but above all, what was really uh, uh, interesting was that the, some of the experts were giving of their time for free, this was before the coronavirus happened, uh, uh, to give particular help to a small business. And I'm sure that businesses will be using this period during the coronavirus where they may not necessarily be able to trade, 
uh, to think very carefully of every aspect of their business, how they can, when the whole thing is over, how they can actually uh, make they take their business forward. And I therefore have a lot of optimism because I believe whilst every business won't survive, sadly, this virus, I think those that do survive will be more proactive and more productive. And I think that is really a really good sign for the future. Okay. Have you any thoughts? Have you been to the Growth Hub, John? No, I, I confess I know nothing very much about it other than it's there. Okay. It's quite unusual to hear a vicar confess. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, an um, <laughs> it's an excellent facility. That, uh, it is. We'll have to lab, take you over. Be, the, the lab and yeah. the councils between them managed to yeah, establish. Yeah, it's a great facility. It's a really great facility. Yeah, okay. Um, I just, this is an interesting one. Um, lots of villages are doing their neighbourhood development plans, and I was interested to get a message from um, Andrew Scarth, who's the chairman of the Down Ampney neighbourhood development plan, and he said, um, never one to miss an opportunity, he said, whilst taking your daily exercise around the village, those of you who live in the village, it seemed to me a good opportunity to take a camera with you and photograph those things you like in Down Ampney and those things you don't. So if you're doing a neighbourhood plan, take your camera out when you're going for a walk. And um, that's down to Andrew's, Andrew Scarth. Well done, Andrew. Um, I like these neighbourhood plans because they get the whole community involved in drawing up the plans. And then there's a referendum uh, in the whole village to say whether they like the plan or not. And I think that's really planning done at the lowest uh, democratic level, right at the, right at the heart of a, of a community. And I think that's really great. Yeah. We're involved in one in Amni Crucis as well you, as down You and I are, yes. And I do hope lots of people take pictures of the churches as well and would want to like them. They will, they will. This is from Mickleton. It's from uh, Gina Bloomfield, and she's commented on the births, weddings and funerals, which we touched on earlier, and saying she's looking forward and sends you both her best wishes. Um, but she'd like to share with us the Mickleton approach. So we've got the Rissington approach, and now we've got the Mickleton approach. Um, Um, in Mickleton, um, just quickly, here as promised, this is calculated. The organisers of Chipping Cam and volunteers following a discussion with Mickleton as to how they were organising themselves to see what the useful information and how they could help collect payment for shopping, insurance, etc. And um, they're under the umbrella of the Mickleton Parish Council to cover them for insurance. They're registered with COVID-19 mutual aid. They're registered on Gloucester County Council. There is, you can't just set up these things. You've got to be officially recognised, haven't you? Um, so when it comes to shopping, customers phone in their order to the local Nisa store. The shop picks and packs. Customers ideally pay by card over the phone when placing the order. If they want to pay by cash, the customer tells the shop what notes to use, and that makes it easier. Volunteers collect all the orders, put the goods by the door, ring the doorbell, and stand well back. Um, if paying by cash or cheque, the customer passes an envelope over the counter containing the relevant amount of money. Volunteers are on standby for a certain day. They now have two or three on duty each day, delivering to 30 households. Um, they have a, what they're calling a hunter number for telephone, whereby um, they, you can set this up for £5, and it's £5 a month, and it will, a number of people can use the same phone number on a telephone list to keep people in touch. Young people, um, they set up the Mickleton Minis, Young Children and Mickleton Horizons for older children, and are looking at how they can share initiatives there. And of course, when it comes to funding, it's all about um, where do they get the money from, and they're fortunate to have had someone anonymously donate um, some money there um, so that uh, these facilities can be put on. Um, so it's great to see that uh, Mickleton, um, we're giving a plug for the middle and the north of the Cotswolds, but also we've done that for, for, for Ampley Cruces. I don't know if you've had any experience of what's going on up in Mickleton and Shipping Camden. So I am free. aware, uh, Gina, thank you for uh, bringing to our attention your terrific efforts in Mickleton. Um, it's a really, um, it, like, uh, like, like Upper Risington, it's one of those communities in the Cotswolds that is growing very fast. And uh, there's a number of really good organisations in Mickleton. And I went uh, one day to one of the elder people's uh, um, groups in Mickleton, and there were two people over 100 and one of 98 in that group. So I don't know what you do in Mickleton, but obviously you've got some very long-lived people up there. And obviously those people are particularly vulnerable. So the volunteering that's going on in Mickleton, I know, will be much in demand. Mm -hmm. Have you any thoughts on, well, I think you've commented on Ampli Cruces, we've got a volunteer network there and the other villages in your patch. Yeah. They happen to be very well blessed with some lovely clergy. To, you know, Craig Bishop, for example, really, really good vicar there. Yeah. And, uh, and Dana, 
who is at Blockly. Um, you know, excellent people. So again, anyone needs any help, give them a ring. Um, just a few sort of things that have come in um, as we've been speaking um, from a lady who, actually I remember her name, because quite an unusual name, Cressida, who was quite pointed about second homes and building second homes in one of the earlier sessions. And so she, she wrote and said she'd like to contribute some positive things. So give ideas rather than have a go with questions and answers. So she said she's heard of a mother and daughter in Warwickshire who started a food delivery service to NHS staff called Food for Heroes which I thought was quite nice, as opposed to Help for Heroes, where they, um, they get together and they, um, they're, they're, um, Hester is a really good cook, and then they put the package together and they deliver it to the local NHS, which is quite a nice uh, thought, and thank you to her for that. Um, here's one which I, I promised I'd read out. Virginia insisted that she read this out, um, that I read it out for you. She said, um, so sparing your blushes, John, I'm a great admirer of John Swanton, who works tirelessly for the church. So I think it's great that he's here today to talk. Um, whether you're religious or not religious, I think it's an ideal opportunity for us to reflect on um, the situation looking at Easter. I'd also like to say a big thanks to the, uh, the Barn Theatre, who have done a brilliant job. And I know she's a great supporter of the Barn Theatre. The only person she doesn't seem to mention is me. Um, and, and we're hurting for the planet. And whilst the planet is, uh, is um, healing, whilst we're hurting, we will all be poorer in pocket, but hopefully richer in spirit. I think that's a lovely form of words. And um, she says that she thinks that the examples that we've been giving online are perfect, and she'd like to give a personal thanks to you, Sir Geoffrey, for putting on these sessions. So I just said I promised I'd ring Thank read you, that out. Thank you, Virginia, for that. I do think that actually one of we've have touched on this in previous sessions one of the very few silver linings of this whole uh, covid 19 episode is that we will all i think rethink our lives and uh, as she says uh, i think we will probably in the future think whether we need to travel about quite so much or whether we can use electronic methods of communicating with each other a bit more and particularly in terms of business travel I'm sure a lot of firms will be looking very carefully at whether all their uh, directors employees and representatives need to travel about quite so much and that will be I think of great benefit in terms of the environment for the planet. You must have been reading my, um, my notes because um, with the power of social media we actually had someone um, who's a friend of a friend um, send us their thoughts from another part so further not even in Gloucestershire this is uh, just a couple of thoughts from Henley and it says in Henley the top of the high street they've had some difficulty in selling the houses because of the pollution near Waitrose because of all those big four by fours and they have a one-way system and some of the traffic lights are typically on green and now they're very fortunate that um, the traffic uh, has reduced to such a such a level that actually these houses look like they're going to be um, more marketable in the future and that the local burghers of Henley uh, want to ensure that the traffic doesn't get polluted up at the top um, but she also made the comment about seeing people walking um, from home rather than jumping in their cars and perhaps we don't need to fly to Europe um, every week for a meeting when we can perhaps use Zoom uh, but she then says perhaps 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 um, we need to think about what's happening within our planet um, and we have a credible opportunity forced upon us surely mankind isn't stupid enough to miss this opportunity I think that's that's really really good I think we could go on I'm just conscious of the fact that um, we've got to a point Sir Geoffrey where you did say that you would consider taking questions I don't know if you want to end on a couple of questions so this is where I have to start really working for my living <laughs> I think you've both done well unless you want John to answer them. Um, I think I think it might be nice because the question answer and I know that the barn no, no, theatre the barn theatre no, that um, that would be fine. Yeah. providing we're okay yes got the note ten minutes so perfect I didn't even have to look um, right um, uh, this is a question let's get this question up. so sorry I'm just looking at. Uh, the next question. Sorry, you bear with me. Yes, this is um, uh, from uh, the, the question that Dillis Neal raised um, to do with uh, Stowe and concern about uh, building work that's going on there and the construction sites around the town. I know you've actually spoken to her, but would you like to reassure people who are seeing building sites um, continuing um, at this time and whether that's classed as essential um, 
uh, work or, or not. I don't know if you can remember because you spoke to Dillis, I gather, directly, Sir Geoffrey. Do you want so to? The reason I'm um, dashing for my iPhone is that whilst I did speak to Dillis yesterday, what I didn't have then was the latest government guidelines, um, which um, I will try very quickly to summarise because it's quite long. But the answer is to um, if you go on the Build UK guidelines. Dillis and anybody else who's worried about construction companies, you will get these very detailed guidelines. Dennis, you might also be interested to know that um, I have asked uh, my office to convey these guidelines to the, build, the construction company involved, which you were worried about, the Brio site in Stowe on the World, and ask them if, to make sure that they will uh, abide by these guidelines. Um, uh, so hopefully some of the worries that you and I know many other residents in Stowe had about that site and about other sites in Stowe, and I know there are other sites, I've had constituents in Sirencester mention this as well. Um, if there's anybody who has a worry about a construction site, if you could let me know where it is and who actually is the firm involved, then I will do the same. I will get on to the chief executive and make sure that they are abiding by the guidelines. Very briefly, to summarise that quite detailed guidance, it's basically that construction work plays an important role in ensuring public safety and the provision of public services. Uh, where it is not possible to follow social distancing guidelines in full in relation to a particular activity, you should consider whether that activity needs to continue for the site to continue to operate, and if so, take all mitigating actions. If you decide the work should go ahead, you should advise staff to wash their hands frequently using soap and water for 20 seconds. Uh, you should, especially um, after blowing their nose, sneezing or coughing, you should still advise staff at all times to keep two metres apart uh, where possible. You should plan your work to minimise contact between workers. Uh, you, as possible, you should keep groups of workers working together in teams that are as small as possible, cohorting. Staff should wa also wash their hands each time before getting into enclosed machinery. Employees should keep the windows of enclosed machinery or enclosed spaces open for ventilation and be careful to avoid touching their face at all times. You should try to use stairs in preference to lifts or hoists. You should protect your staff. You should remind colleagues daily to come into work only if they are well and no one in their household is self-isolating. As I say, the Construction Leadership Council has published more detailed advice on how you might cover it, come, carry out government guidelines. And additional useful information for firms can be act, act, accessed on the Bill UK's website. Okay. And I, I, again, I can't stress that enough that w employees should talk to their employers. And if they are not happy uh, about coming into work, then they shouldn't be made to come into work. The problem, I, I gather, having investigated this particular Brio site in Stowe yesterday, is that a lot of those workers are self-employed workers, and uh, I can't quite understand why, but they wouldn't be eligible for the self-employed scheme. So uh, there is a particular imperative to them still to want to keep working. Yeah. But again, I would say to all construction um, firms, please adhere to those guidelines. We are talking about people's lives. It is vital that you do so. Okay. There's two, I mean, I'm going to get cut to the chase on two very um, important questions. One relates to holiday homes um, from South Cerny. Um, and then I'm going to end on the question that you were asked directly about the um, misinformation that's going on about um, grants available to MPs. So if I could just take this one quickly, Sir Geoffrey. Um, there are approximately 900 holiday homes around the lakes in our parish. This is South Cerny and this is the uh, clerk to the South Cerny Parish Council. They are classed as holiday homes and um, all the owner occupiers must have their primary residence elsewhere. However, many of them appear to be currently occupied by their owners or people renting them. This does not appear to comply with government guidelines for everyone uh, to remain in their primary residence. What can be done to rectify this situation? Thanks, Robert Cowley. So the answer is very clear. I think those people that came to their second homes before the government guidelines and lockdown came on the 23rd of March were fully entitled to do so. Now the government's advice is very clear indeed. People should not, I repeat, not be making a journey to their second homes. It's not necessary and it puts both them and other residents uh, in the Cotswolds at risk. So I would say to... Uh, I can't remember the name of your... Uh, Robert Cowley. Robert Cowley. 
if you find that people are still coming to their second homes, which they should not be doing now because the government guidelines are very clear, then I think you probably uh, should consider um, at least notifying the police. When I, when I um, talk to um, uh, Superintendent Elsom of the Cotswold Constabulary, he said that they would like to know about incidents where people are breaking government guidelines. They won't necessarily investigate every single case, but if they know about them and there's a pattern, then they will investigate. So uh, I think uh, hopefully people will heed the government guidelines. If they don't, then no doubt others may wish to inform the police and no doubt, in, in some cases, some blatant cases, the police may wish to have a, a, a word with the owners. The problem is that if they're here now, to make another journey back from where they came is creating another lot of risk. So um, the answer is, don't come, please. We've got, we've got one minute, and I, I know you want to um, uh, respond to this question. Um, but before we do take this question, I do think that we've got so many questions coming in and so many thoughts uh, for the day that I think we perhaps need to think again about doing when we're doing this next friday i do think we might need to think again about the idea that you had about focusing on uh, children whether we could split the session or have an extra session by talking to the barn theater because i i know there'll be people here who will say well you you promoted one person's business and not another person's business i did try to move quickly through but i hope people will apologize uh, accept my apology if we didn't get to your question but i do think we're going to need to think again sir jeffrey that this format clearly is working okay here's the one that I know is on a lot of people's lips. Um, it's been reported that MPs have been given £10,000 to assist them in working from home. This is a sum equal to a year's rent for many in your constituency. Firstly, is it true? Secondly, since MPs routinely work from home and thus are already equipped adequately, in what way are you using this money? Thirdly, how will you use, uh, any, how will you use any unused funds? And, and you've always been someone who likes to take a question directly, and so there's a direct question to end with. Would you like to comment? Well, the first thing to say, I wish to be very clear about the answer to this um, uh, prep story, that it was inaccurately reported. I know that I nor any other member of parliament have been given £10,000. We have been given an allowance up to £10,000. That doesn't mean to say we are expected to spend £10,000 or indeed anything like it for any additional cost that we can absolutely ver verify through receipts that we've incurred by having to deal with the extra workload, either on equipment or by extra staff or whatever, to deal with the extra workload of COVID virus. In my case, the only thing I will be claiming out of that £10,000 is the cost of this new laptop because I found that the workload was such that I had to have a reliable up-to-date laptop to deal with this volume of work, possibly a printer to go with it, and that is all I will be claiming. So it was an inaccurate story uh, and the answer is we can only draw the money if we actually expend the money. So unfortunately, it will not be possible for us to have that money and donate it to any charity as some broadcasters seem to think we can. The simple answer is I will not get a penny piece in my own pocket. I will only get part of, the, and in my case, a very small part of that allowance for something that I've actually spent money on and can verify by a receipt to the IPSA, our uh, parliamentary pay body. Okay. I, 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 that's a great place to end, and thank you for being so direct in your, your response. I know people will find that refreshing, Sir Geoffrey. And um, uncharacteristically, I'm going to shut up and hand over to you to thank you both, uh, though, for what you've done today, because you didn't know those um, thoughts were coming in, so you answered them without any preparation. And thank you both, particularly to John um, for his attendance, and, and again to you, Sir Geoffrey, for the way in which you've handled the session. Looking forward to next week and what we're now calling um, your live streaming. And um, thanks again to the Barn Theatre. Can I hand over to you, Sir Geoffrey? Well, thank you all very much for listening. David, as always, very professionally uh, uh, um, compared and introduced. A, a great tribute to you. I thought, John, you said some extremely moving and well thought out uh, thoughts, and which I know will be of great comfort to all of those that have uh, joined this session. So thank you for that. Thank you. May we ask you perhaps if you'd be prepared to come back at the future at some stage, and perhaps not every time, but, but at the future. I'm sure that people would love to hear from you again. Uh, so I'd like to also thank the Barn Theatre. Uh, you've been fantastic as always. 
And finally, may I end on a plug for next Friday's um, uh, live streaming event. Um, the thought is at the moment, but subject to what you were saying just now, that this was going to be an event for children of, of all ages. And the idea was that we've asking um, children to send us in examples of their drawings, their paintings, their poems, their articles. Uh, just tell us what they've been doing, whether they like not going to school, whether they would prefer to be at school, whatever it has. Yeah. We'd like to hear from you all, and uh, we'd like to hear how life is during this crisis. I think we need uh, to talk to the BBC about whether they let us have an extra session or not. Um, well, um, uh, we, can, we can ask them. Um, the, the, bar, the Barn Broadcasting I, I, I don't think we must, we must pressurise them, because yeah. you, we mustn't overtax anybody. They're giving all of this for volunteer for yeah. nothing, and I think okay. it's absolutely fantastic facility what you're all doing out there in the black. I can't see who you all are and where you all are, but it's fantastic. So let's end on that and look forward would, to next would Friday. Would it be nice to ask John to say a few words? Yes, John, would you to, like to, to sum summarize. up for us or give us a few final thoughts? Thank you. Can I just wish everyone a safe and happy Easter and look to the future positively and be a good neighbour? Thank you. Thank you very much.